as the world seems to jump from one crisis to the next, how are Christians supposed to keep a firm foundation in the world rocked by hurricanes and big fires and wars and other turmoil? We'll give you some options tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you, thank you, and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. Our guest tonight is convinced that <laughs> faith in Jesus and the words and works of his mother has proven throughout the history of the church to give us the best option for getting ourselves and our families to heaven. She is a homeschooling mother of four as well as a faculty member of Pontifex University, which is online. And also she's the author of The Marian Option, God's Solution to a Civilization in Crisis. So please welcome Dr. Carrie Gress. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, it's great to be here. I, uh, I really enjoyed mm -hmm. reading your book, The Marian Option. Thank you. Uh, it was part of my ongoing reflection on various themes about this year mm -hmm. of the uh, 100th anniversary of Our Lady's apparitions at Fatima. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very appropriate book. I hope a lot of our viewers mm -hmm. get it uh, because it brings in uh, some great issues. Why did you choose the top the the title though, Marian? The Marian option. option, right? It's kind did of you an unusual title. Did you want to choose Saint Martha or, <laughs> you know, Mary Magdalene? What what's right. the Marian option well, about? Well, the the title itself came was started out really by um, the Benedict option. This is something that has been created quite something of a wave in Christian circles, both Catholics and Protestants. What does that and, mean, though, the Benedict yeah, the Option? Benedict we're going from options right. to others. No, I there's, there's um, feel like it really got kicked McDonald's. off. We've got, <laughs> we got a, a lot of choices here, yeah. Father. Um, no, the Benedict Option uh, started when journal, journalist Rod Dreyer started looking at our cultures mm -hmm. um, and said, you know, things are getting bad for Christians and they're only going to get worse. And so he s recommended that p many people start looking at, at how we can really retreat from the world. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, he's been kind of difficult to pin down exactly what he means, but he's, initially he was using the model of, of St. Benedict and this idea of retreating, you know, as Rome is falling, um, you've got St. Benedict retreating to the monastery and sort of recreating civilization through that. So it, that's what it started out as. And I was intrigued by the idea because it was getting a lot of attention in the press and I knew he was working on a book on it. And so I, I ended up giving a lecture on the Benedict Option, trying to figure out for myself exactly what, what he meant by it. Um, but I had also, um, like a year prior, written an article about John Paul II and why, it was, why he was just this great example of how to deal with everything from Christian persecution to, you know, turmoil in, in civilization. There are few people, I think, that lived under persecution more than John Paul II, both with the, the Nazis and then, of course, with the Soviets. And it ended up really triumphing over them, helping bring down communism. And so, um, you know, I had seen that he offered, his life offered us this field guide. And um, so I was contrasting the two of these. And everything with John Paul II, though, I, I kept coming back to this idea that Mary was behind all of it. There was so much, uh, you know, Mary's influence was really there. And then I thought about, well, what's, what has been the biggest, um, you know, evangelization where we, we know converts happen? Well, most likely Our Lady of Guadalupe. What about heresies? Well, Our Lady has dealt best with heresies. And I kept ticking through this list of all these things that we're struggling with in our culture and, and realizing that she had, had the best answer for them. And um, so certainly the Benedict Option really set off this firestorm of a lot of different people making suggestions about how it is. There's a, 
the, the Gregory option and all these different ideas about how we, sh we need to face the, these issues in the world today. And I don't necessarily, I'm not debunking any of them, but I think the Marian option, uh, you know, through the research and what I've found really is much more fundamental than all the rest, that it's sort of as a, as a piece underneath or, or more basic um, than all of these other options that, that um, Mary's behind. When you state, for instance, that Our Lady uh, helps with conversions, mm -hmm. a good example being? Uh, when she appeared to Juan Diego as Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. Juan Diego himself, a Native American, mm -hmm. who sees Our Lady who looks like he does. Right. You know, uh, and, and is able to speak his language, his dialect. Mm -hmm and starts an evangelization that sees the conversion of tens of millions in Absolutely. the Americas. Yeah. Uh, far more than were lost in the Reformation in Europe mm -hmm. were gained in exactly. the Americas. And healing that rift too between the Spaniards and the natives there. I think mm -hmm. that was another piece, a really big piece of That's what right. she did during that time. Mm -hmm. yeah, be, the, 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 the tension, the, the, you know, a lot of the Spaniards tried to enslave some uh, some of the Native right. Americans, and mm -hmm. um, that, that'll make you tense, <laughs> you know, with, with right. the local folks. So um, by doing something that evil, um, so th th there's that. But when you say heresies, how did Our Lady mm -hmm. fight against heresies? Well, th this is uh, where Saint Dominic comes in, and Saint Dominic was faced with the issue of the Albigensians in southern France, and um, trying to gain back the, the Catholics there. And this is when, um, as tra tradition has it, Our Lady appeared to him and gave him the rosary. And that, that's what the rosary that we know today came mm -hmm. through St. Saint, Saint Dominic. And I, I think other than that story about St. Dominic, nobody really knows what an Albigensian is. You know, we don't really, um, it's not a problem anymore. So no. um, yeah, no. she's uh, definitely been influential in, in that respect um, as well. And, and I would add too, um, at the Council of Ephesus, mm -hmm. uh, the, she, she was key as St. Cyril of Alexandria, who presided over that mm -hmm. council, you know, to undo the heresy about Christ that mm -hmm. was taught by Nestorius. Mm -hmm. Understanding Our Lady as the Mother of God, the Theotokos, right. was key. And big, the big celebrate, the people went you know, enthusiastically in favor as they went to the Church of Our Lady in Ephesus. Mm -hmm. And then in Rome, they built Santa Maria Maggiore, the, mm -hmm. uh, which is still there. Right. So these are, uh, th these are some examples, and there are others too, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of, of that are the role of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. The question then would be, how does one make this Marian option? What do you do? <laughs> Right. Well, I, I, that's, this is the best thing I think about the Marian option is it's really simple. I think some of the other options require a lot of, um, you know, moving or changing jobs or what have you. And, um, but I think this is the, the best thing about Our Lady is that she, when, when we either through, we can start praying the rosary or we can consecrate ourselves to her. But the big, the main goal is to, to draw closer to her, to have a stronger relationship with her. Mm -hmm. And I think we can see in the lives of the saints that when the saints have done that, then the Holy Spirit works through these individuals in remarkable ways. And this is why John Paul II is such a perfect example. To see his life, this is a man that was, you know, at one point he had to retreat. He had to hide at the archbishop's residence when the Nazis were hunting him down. At another time, he uses politics, he uses humor, he uses all these different ways, the theater, all these different ways uh, to deal with his enemies. And and this is what is really the beauty of the Marian option, is it's not just sort of a, a uh, one size um, fits all kind of approach, but in fact, Our Lady, when we draw closer to her, um, she's gonna bring out the best in each of us. And she's gonna allow our, our gifts and our mission to really come through in a very unique way um, where we do we have that nimbleness of spirit like you see in, in John Paul II's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it's one of the th nice things about the, uh, I think it's an appendix in your book, mm -hmm. is that you right. give uh, a wide variety of mm -hmm. ways mm -hmm. that people have traditionally come to know Our Lady. One of them sure. as at Fatima, 
Mm -hmm. A lady had asked everybody to pray the rosary every day mm -hmm. as a way to undo the evil in our culture. Right. Um, extremely important, mm -hmm. and everybody should be doing that. Mm -hmm. What else do you see? What, what are some of the other ways? Um, certainly, there, there. Like I mentioned, Marian consecration is a, is a, is a way to go deeper. But there are and how, other how things. How does somebody get to do that? A Marian consecration. Well, that um, by and large, it's, it follows uh, the teachings of Saint Louis de Montfort, mm -hmm. and he um, offered this 33-day method whereby you can consecrate yourself to Our Lady. And um, I think he describes it as becoming a slave to Our Lady. It's um, some of the language is difficult, I think, for our our um, time period, and so. So Father Gately, Father Michael Gately has actually offered a, a different book, I think it's called 33 Days to Glory, right. similar kind of Marian consecration, but a lot more accessible in terms of its language. Um, and so it's, there, there are many ways. I'm actually working on a children's um, Mar book for Marian consecration right now, mm -hmm. um, using pulling in a lot of literature and, and different stories that children will know to help them understand Our Lady better. Mm -hmm. and to, to make that relationship grow stronger because that was the one thing that just overwhelmingly came to me when I was writing this book was just how much she wants to help us and how many different times and different ways that she has come throughout history uh, to try and, and help her children. And um, the more that we draw closer to her, then the easier it is for her to, to help us. Uh, and I cannot help but notice how important it was that the region where St. Louis de Montfort mm -hmm. had preached so mm -hmm. well and had encouraged the people to make a consecration to Our Lady. It was mm -hmm. a consecration to Jesus through consecration right. to Our Lady. Right. That area withstood the mm -hmm. attempts of the French Republic uh, wow. government. Mm -hmm. And 200,000 of them stood so firmly with the faith Mm -hmm. that they, they were martyred. Wow. They were wow. killed by their own, their government hated the Catholic faith mm -hmm. and tried to impose pure reason as God. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they were guillotining anybody who disagreed with them wow. as being unreasonable. But mm -hmm. they, in, in the Vendée region where he had preached, mm -hmm. they burned them to death, they drowned mm -hmm. them and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, but they stood faithful. They kept the faith, yeah. And, and when the world turned viciously against them mm -hmm. in the name of Republican liberalism, mm -hmm. that's what they called it then, right. um, th that was a good example. Mm -hmm. You also talk about Lepanto a bit, don't you? Right, I do. I, Lepanto has been in the news a lot, um, I think, as people are talking about the rosary and the power of the rosary. And I was really fascinated to find how much of a backstory there is to the, the Battle of Lepanto. That, in fact, Lepanto is sort of this crowning battle that happened. And, and there were just centuries, really, be, prior to that, of Our Lady working to um, help, help Europe uh, rid itself of, of the um, Muslims. And so it's, it was well, fascinating they, to it, look at, at it, Spain, in particular, and yeah. how it all started there. And um, Lepanto kind of is an extension of that of Spanish I, I th sovereignty. I think that it, it's, it's key to understand that you know, um, various Muslim governments had been attacking Europe mm -hmm. repeatedly. Over I and mean, over again, yeah. There were thousands of attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look up on the internet for the, a mm -hmm. map of all the attacks mm -hmm. on Europe, but right. at Lepanto was a huge, a huge invasion battle. force. Right, naval force, and the Christians were largely outnumbered. And, you know, like so many of the stories with Our Lady, um, the weather changes or, you know, fog rolls in or something happens. And, and that yeah. is really what happened with Lepanto was the change of wind and uh, it helped the, the Christian forces, the Holy League, to be to able to conquer the Turks in a way that nobody expected. Um, so I think that's, that was the exciting thing. I think there's so many books on, on Mary and I, I got overwhelmed at one point as I was writing this because I thought, you know, what have I bitten off here? What have I gotten yeah. myself into? Yeah. Because um, I thought, what, how am I going to be able to write something new about her? But what I was able to do with this book, and I'm, I know it was the Holy Spirit, is to present her um, 
you know, bird's eye look. Instead of going deep in one theological point or deep into one apparition, I wanted to show sort of the whole picture of, you know, these fascinating and varied ways that she's helped throughout history and then sort of link many of them together mm -hmm. because there are very clear links to them. Um, and so that was one of the exciting things was to just see these connections um, between Spain and Lepanto and, and vice versa and, uh, you know, all these different connections throughout the world. It, even at Lourdes, one of the nice stories that you tell about Lourdes mm -hmm. is that this was an apparition in 1858, mm -hmm. but there was something mm -hmm. that had happened right. where Our Lady helped bring peace to that right. area. Yeah centuries early in the yeah. time of Charlemagne. Right. Tell that story. Yeah, about a thousand years prior, there was uh, a, a, a Saracen named Mirat, and he and his uh, the other Saracens had been there for about 40 years, and they were in this fortress that had the name of Masabiel. And um, the, the, um, all of the Christian forces came in, and they realized they had to starve them out. There was really no other way to, to that the fortress was impenetrable. And so Mirat had made an oath to Muhammad that he would never surrender to any man. Mm -hmm. And so um, what happened was it, it finally, you know, it's been months, and, and they're running out of resources, and they're, Usually they're about dead. Usually on both dead. sides. Yeah, well, yeah. and, and the, the Christians were getting tired. You know, everybody's worn out. And a, a bird had dropped a, f a fish into Masabiel, the fortress, and Mirat, in order to show that they were fine, he took the fish and threw it out at the, the Christian troops. Well, the local bishop said, you know, I think this is a trick. So he went to Mirat and he said, look, I know your oath, um, but would you consider surrendering to the Queen of Heaven? I'm her envoy. And with that, he surrendered and all of them, all of the men converted to Christianity and he ended up taking the name Loris, which is where the name Lourdes comes from, is from him um, yeah. because of his, obviously became a, a, an incredible Christian um, after that. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, uh, an important episode mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we are engaged in an ongoing war against terrorism, especially right. Muslim terrorism. Mm -hmm. It's now spreading to Africa, as we saw in Niger, mm -hmm. uh, and lots of times in Nigeria and other right. countries. And just uh, the ongoing fight mm -hmm. m has an impact, but there needs to be another kind of transformation. Mm -hmm. And that, well, they may not be able to surrender to a man, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, Clinton or Bush or mm -hmm. Obama or Trump, it doesn't matter. Right. It may be that Our Lady will be someone who can right. help, you know, and we, sh we should mm -hmm. pray for mm -hmm. all these folks. And she's very revered by, by Muslims. She has a, uh, there's a book in the Quran about her. I mean, she's actually mentioned more in the Quran than she is in scripture. So it's it's fascinating to see this these connections too that she is very re respected. Um, in fact, she's them. the only woman named mm -hmm. in the whole Quran. Mm -hmm. No other woman's name is given. Hmm. Although I was called the wife of somebody or mother of somebody, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. she's the one who's mentioned by, by name. name. Um. And it's um, yeah. So th this would be something as we people are anxious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the the violence that we saw in mm -hmm. Las Vegas mm -hmm. with a man with no apparent reason, right? you know, killing lots of people, mm -hmm. whether it's unreasonable killing or mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, terrorism, mm -hmm. we, the rest of us, have an anxiety. Sure. You're talking about a way to address that. Right, and I, I think... For me, this was an incredibly hopeful experience writing this book, and I think I've heard from a lot of people that have read it that they have a new hope about our, our situation at this point, because um, one of the things that I look at is this idea of, of creative more minorities, and through the, the lens of uh, the historian Arnold Toynbee. Now, Toynbee studied civilizations very extensively. He looked mm -hmm. at 26 different civilizations, what made them rise, what made them fall. Most people know of Toynbee because of his um, famous quote about civilizations commit suicide, they're not murdered. Um, but one of the things... And, uh, what does that mean? Cause right. don't, don't just keep talking about that. <laughs> Explain that. That's a wonderful quote. It is a great quote. Well, his whole point is that civilizations basically um, 
break themselves down morally and therefore they cannot hold themselves up structurally um, because the moral core, core of, the, of the people is gone. Um, they, you look at uh, lots of civilizations, like mm -hmm. Rome is a classic right, example. perfect example. They yeah. lost faith in mm -hmm. being Roman. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe in it, not just mm -hmm. not in their gods. They didn't believe mm -hmm. in the values. They didn't love their language anymore. Mm -hmm. the, their language took a, a, a nosedive. Mm -hmm. They didn't want children anymore. They were right. aborting them, mm -hmm. and they were putting them out for animals to eat. Mm -hmm. they, they, they just lost faith in themselves, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to fight for their own empire anymore. They just didn't care. Right. That's what you mean by suicide, as, I, I, mean as I understood it. Yeah, it's not, and and therefore they were weakened, and the barbarians could come in and take over the, right. you know, take over the spoils. Um, and so and that's what And when the barbarians came means. in, what they did, it, it was a sandcastle, and it mm -hmm. crumbled in their it, hands. Exactly, exactly. So, and that's what Toynbee means is, um, so if you have a civilization and a culture that understands who they are, um, especially if you've got God and and the church at the center of it, then there, there's going to be an incredible amount of strength there. Um, in, in this, within the civilization. But the one thing that Toynbee makes very clear is that there are these groups, or even with one person, um, called creative minorities. And the creative minority is uh, someone who either has an idea or who has done the homework of a lot of prayer and is able to um, bring back t to a civilization through some kind of new idea or new inspiration. Mm -hmm. So St. Benedict of Norcia is an incredible example because of the fact that he was a hermit for three years, you know, he's doused himself in prayer, and then he's able to go out and create the monastic system um, that we certainly know helped save much of civilization, and, and then what the Christian church was and culture was able to rebuild upon. Um, As a matter of fact, it, without the Benedictines, we wouldn't even know about the Romans. Right. They preserved so much the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the same with the monks in the Eastern Church. Mm -hmm. They preserved the Greek writers. Right. We wouldn't know them without the monks. Yes. And all of the great inventions were done in the West by the Benedictines. Mm -hmm. I, they're mm -hmm. key. Right. In terms of agriculture, all those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah the, the, they reinvented the plow and the stirrup. Wow. The, yeah. These are just you know, basic inventions mm -hmm. that change civilization. Right. And it's, so it's a handful of people that change civilization. And I think this is Toynbee's point. There's these mystic type people, he calls them mystics, um, because of the prayer element, that then come back into the world and they offer an, a new way to live. And um, so we can see that that, that was St. Gregory the Great and his reforms of the church. But even in the last thousand years, Our Lady is really at the heart of many of these sort of creative minorities, whether it's St. Dominic or um, different apparitions that happened um, at various stages. So I think that that's one of the things that's exciting is that it doesn't take a mass change with, um, you know, a broad change among the whole culture. You, you don't have to happen. worry about how the polls are doing and, right, exactly. and getting enough people right. on your side. Exactly. That it's much more of a, you know, a lot more work is done in silence and prayer than, than out, you know, protesting or what have you. Um, but it's, it's a small group of people that can radically change a, a culture in dramatic ways. And that's very hopeful that's to me. That's exactly. That's one of the key points. Mm -hmm. But for that small group of people to do that, mm -hmm. they have to have a center. Right. And that's where Our Lady comes in. Exactly. And, and devotion to her mm -hmm. and praying. The, exactly. Instead of being scattered around with fear mm -hmm. and the chicken little approach, right. and everything is falling, not just mm -hmm. the sky, everything is falling. Sure. And yeah. there's global warming cooking mm -hmm. it when it falls. Uh -huh. You know, this is... That's our, our culture, mm -hmm. and this is where we're going to find the center, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in peace as right. we go forward. Right, and I think even, you know, this week there's an article on the National Catholic Register about um, someone in the fires, that the, the mother and the grandmother were praying the rosary, and you can see the pictures that the fire basically stopped right at the fence line of their house. None of the homes were, were damaged in the fire, and, you know, there's just incredible story after story of these kinds of instances where people, uh, you know, use the rosary and, and, and asked Our Lady's help, and she really performed in miraculous ways. On the other hand, 
we see this, the, the uh, removal of prayer. I mean, we mm -hmm. the, the Supreme Court ordered the removal of prayer and scripture from schools back mm -hmm. in 1962. Right. And as I like to point out, by 67, 68, they replaced prayer hmm. with metal detectors at the doors. Yeah. Because people were bringing guns and knives mm -hmm. to schools mm -hmm. and they became dangerous places. Right. And you see the anger mm -hmm. of some parts of our culture, mm -hmm. the Intifa people and a variety of right. others who are just in a rage to tear down mm -hmm. and others who are in a rage to stop religion at any cost. Mm -hmm. And we have to be a creative minority, right. according to you, Right. who listens in prayer right. and turns to Our Lady. Right. And you think we can make a difference? Oh, I know we can make a difference. I think it's, um, you know, it's one of those things that even in my own life, you know, I, I'm a mom, I have four kids, and I have, I've gone through these stages where I would be up nursing and I would be in a panic about what's going to happen to my children and so concerned and every possible thing that could possibly happen to my children would go through my head, you know, at three in the morning. And um, as I come, came to understand really what it is that Our Lady's doing and how accessible, I mean, this isn't just a matter of this happened a long time ago. There's so many things that happen on a, on a daily basis in our lives that our, our Lady is anxious to help us with and she's promptly there. And so those three o'clock in the morning, panic attacks have, have pretty much subsided at this yeah, point. Yeah. And um, I, I just, now I just turn to the rosary and feel Do so much confidence. Do you miss the panic attacks? No, I don't miss the panic <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. So the being panic calm attack at all. and prayerful, right? You, you it's like gone that a long better. Way. Yeah, I get a lot more, a lot more sleep, much kinder mother. Yes, all those things. <laughs> well, um, no wonder you out. wrote this book. Yeah, no, it was that's a, real a good gift, idea um, for me. But I, that, I think that's the exciting thing is it's um, there's there's so much hope in it as far as what we can do, uh, you know, just sitting in our cars, sitting in a church, uh, you know, when we can't sleep, all, all these different play, different times we have opportunities to turn to Our Lady and ask her to help us with these situations as well as the hot messes that are, are cropping up all around the world. And you know your kids range in age from eight down to three. three. Mm -hmm. And so um, you uh, do they just sort of let you get about two hours to make a holy <laughs> hour and just be at peace by yourself? Oh yeah. No, <laughs> I, um, uh, yeah, I haven't. You have to my, grab my, snatches of time. That's exactly it. My, my spiritual life had to change dramatically. And I, right. for a long time, I really missed it. Um, I really missed having, you know, I was someone that loved to spend an hour in silence every day. And of course, I haven't had an hour of silence, you know, in a long time. But, yeah, uh, yeah. but I think that I did find ways, snippets, you know, when I'm laying down with a child, when it's bedtime. Um, when I'm waiting to pick up somebody in the car, you know, all these different times. We've also started a holy hour uh, as a family, the children and I, and our parish has been great. They have allowed us to um, have an hour when it, children can be there. So we don't have to worry about the noise and all of that. And so that's made a big difference, I think, too, is just um, helping to sanctify my children. But um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. finding a different way. Yeah, and, and that's, we have to adapt. Right. That's, yeah. again, that's one of the things I like. Your appendix gives, a wide variety of things mm -hmm. so you can adapt to your situation like other saints have done throughout the centuries exactly. and then we go forward to choose to find Our Lady as a source of bringing us to the center who's Christ mm -hmm. and going forward. Exactly. We've got to take a little break. Great. Um, again, I want to encourage you to go to carriegress.com uh, find out more about what she's doing and her writing and other ideas, as well as get her book, The Marian Option. Then we'll talk more with her and get you in on the line as well as our studio audience. So please stay with us.
Thank you. Welcome back. Before we get to our questions, I uh, want to inform you that there is the first official shrine to Saint Sharbel Makhlouf in the United States. It was dedicated last month at the National Shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes on the campus of Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg. And we want to thank the organization known as the Family of St. Sharbel for providing this video to us. They made this um, uh, video you can see of uncovering the statue of St. Sharbel. You can also possible for all of us to come and celebrate the erection of the statue of St. Charles. May it be. All right, and uh, so they're, they're doing the dedication one of the Maronite priests who was there to, to do that. And um, so in case you didn't know, there were no photographs or paintings of St. Charbel uh, during his life. Hmm. None at all. But in, I, I think it was the 1940s or 50s, uh, there, uh, there were some people gathered at the, sh the original shrine in Lebanon, uh, at the place where he's buried. And they were outside the wall of the monastery, and uh, a priest and two seminarians were there. They took photographs. And when they developed it, they could see St. Charbel behind it, the people they're photographing. So there were three people there, but St. Charbel was right behind them. So all the depictions in that statue and all the other pictures you see of St. Charbel are based on that photograph, hmm. not one from his own time. Which That's is, amazing. It is amazing. And, and the family of St. Charbel has uh, witnessed lots and lots of miracles hmm. over the years. You ready for some questions? Sure. All right. Let's start off with Thomas. Thomas, where are yes, you Bob. calling from? From Tennessee. Where in Tennessee? Kingsport, Tennessee. Kingsport, oh, way up there. That's way up yes, in the Father. northeast corner. What's your question? My, my question is, uh, and a comment. First of all, I'd like to compliment Dr. Grass on a wonderful book and uh, affirm her that not only do I believe, but many people that I speak to within my parish and within our faith believe that the Blessed Mother is and has been the, the cure for the ills of the world. Mm -hmm. And speaking about the cures for the ills of the world, uh, you had uh, briefly touched on the fact that the Blessed Mother, our Blessed Mother, could be the peace bridge between, or will be the peace bridge between Islam and Catholicism, mm -hmm. because uh, I firmly believe that, that uh, Islam is not necessarily just after Christianity, but more directly after the Eucharist. Hmm. And, and uh, in believing that, I believe also that she is the answer because she appeared in a town that was named after the only revered daughter of Muhammad. Uh, Dr. Gretz, could you further comment on that? Because we don't believe that's a coincidence at all. Mm -hmm. So, well, as a matter of fact, two of the great apparitions, Lourdes, Lourdes and is named after a Muslim who changed his name to Loras mm -hmm. after he was baptized, mm -hmm. and then Fatima, right, right, which is the name of the only daughter mm -hmm. of Muhammad who survived him. Mm -hmm. All his children died before he did, except for Fatima. Mm -hmm. And a princess named Fatima converted to, to Catholicism, and the town was named after to her. her. Exactly. No, I think it's a fascinating connection. I'm, I um, would love to d dive into this deeper and see if there really are more connections beyond these two places. I can't imagine that there, I mean, I can imagine that there probably are. Um, but I do think because of the fact that she is revered, I mean, we, we know that Islam does not have a, um, a deep um, reverence for women the way that, say, we, we see in Christianity. And yet here she is on this very clear pedestal um, within their faith. So, yeah, I think it's a, a very interesting question and something that we can all keep an eye on um, to and pray about um, to really bridge the, the gap between 
Catholicism and, and Islam. Yeah, in, in fact, next year, Thomas, um, I, I already gave the manuscript. I think it'll be published next year. It's a book I wrote comparing the teaching about Jesus and Mary in the Quran mm -hmm. and in the Gospels. Wow. So it, I, I'll go through them verse by verse in the Quran. Mm -hmm. uh, Surah 19 mm -hmm. is the one about uh, Maryam. Mm -hmm. Mary, and then the gospel text. And, uh, and I hope for that to be a way for us to build right. a bridge of understanding based mm -hmm. on knowing what mm -hmm. the two teach about Mary and right. Jesus. Right, and that's an incredible resource, I think, for so many people, because I think for a lot of us, we feel like Islam is kind of inaccessible. I mean, obviously, there's a language issue, but mm -hmm. where do you even start, you know, trying to find ways that you can yeah. communicate in, about it with, mm -hmm. with those who are Yes, Muslim. exactly. I have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Fort Lauderdale. Fine. Good to have you. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, your question? Question is, uh, other than Mass today at the Shrine up in Hansville, I've yet to, or not seen any parish priests on Sunday Mass mentioning Mary, saying the Hail Mary as either before or after Mass. It seems like there's a dearth of Mary in our, in our parishes. And I'm just wondering what can be done about that. Yes. The Marian dearth. Um, well, that's what the Marian option well, is all see, about, that, is exactly. that, you know, the, the, quenching that. The absence right. mm -hmm. of Mary in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that that's unrelated to the nastiness that we see yeah. in our culture. No, I think it's, it's very much connected to that. And um, I've actually, through this book, I, I was doing a lot of research on, on Mary and Jesus. And you always hear them spoken of as... Um, the, the new Adam and the new Eve. So there's always this male, female binary options. And I, it occurred to me that we think about an antichrist, not just as a person, but as a movement the way St. John does, but we've never actually talked about an anti-Mary. And um, so I ended up doing some research on this idea of the anti-Mary and, um, and have had it okayed by different theologians um, that it's not too far off the, the rails as far as a new concept. Um, but, and in fact, I think if we look at what's happened with our culture, on the one hand, we have a lot of, um, the popes have become more Marian, and there's a, a lot more focus on Our Lady um, in, within the church. But simultaneously, you also see this widening gap between particularly women and Our Lady. I mean, to even suggest at this stage in history that um, women should become like Mary, it, you know, I mean, people will laugh at you if you, if you say mm -hmm. that if you suggest that Mary should be a model for women to follow um, because we just don't even can't even wrap our minds around that what what that means and it's so far afield from um, our own experience and I think you know looking at our, the role models that we have today I mean everyone from um, you know Gloria Steinem Lena Dunham Madonna Taylor Swift on and on there there's not a, a, a role model that embodies any of the virtues that we would attribute to Mary most easily I think um, and so that's one of the, the clear signs that um, we are living in something of an anti-Marian age um, at this stage. And um, so it's, it's even more incumbent, I think, upon us to try and remedy that. That's why another reason why I think she's coming, because we can see throughout history that there are patterns within the church. There's a crisis, and God sends the remedy. It's Benedict came with the, the Romans. You see St. Francis coming when the church is choking with riches. He's the Pavarello, the little poor one. So we can see that as this anti-Mary movement, um, you know, that's marked by rejection of motherhood. I mean, even in the 3,000 abortions that happen in our country daily. Well, again, it, it's, it's an, an antidote to that. Yeah, the, the ability to convince women to turn against their own child inside right. the womb. Right, it's astounding. I mean, if it you is. think about that, that and to in turn fact, violently this is, right, against right. the child in your womb. Right, and not just as. Uh, a sad reality, but something, you know, shout your abortion and be proud of it. I mean, this is this, this, that we have gotten to a stage where, in fact, um, women have been convinced of this is, is beyond scary, I think, in, in many and respects. You also see, yeah, in some ways, the, the, the recent news mm -hmm. that um, the uh, various uh, abuses of women mm -hmm. in Hollywood Mm -hmm. that are becoming more and more known. It's, it's, it's right. something that seems to be coming out, uh, coming out increasingly mm -hmm. right now. Um, for, uh, and uh, hopefully it'll help to put a stop to it. But yeah. 
In contrast, mm -hmm. in the 1940s, an Academy Award winning movie uh, was <laughs> The Song, Song of, of Bernadette. Bernadette. Right. Imagine that even being played in a theater, much less winning an Academy Award today. I mean, that's it it was gives followed, you a great marker of how far we've come. It wasn't fallen. too many years later that a movie about Fatima was mm -hmm. made. Right. Yeah, it's remarkable. You, you know, you, you look there mm -hmm. and, you know, this is something where mm -hmm. the focus on women's sensuality mm -hmm. has led to this violence against women. Yes. Well, that, I guess it's okay. Women think mm -hmm. that this is good. So isn't it okay for me to be abusive? That, yeah. That's the thinking yeah. in, in the culture. Well, and it's, it's all wrapped up in this notion of, of license. I mean, if there's going to be any kind of license, then we have to expect that there are going to be people that are going to abuse it and abuse the weakest uh, among them. Um, but I, I think the, the problem is really systemic. I mean, if you look at all those corridors of power, if you look mm -hmm. at New York and the fashion industry and the, and the media, if you look at Washington, D.C. and policymakers, if you look at Hollywood, all of them are sort of preaching the exact same message, and, and abortion is really at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's fascinating. That you, it's very difficult to find voices out there of women who are not, you know, tutting along with the, this, this dogma that they have. I mean, it really is a dogma because there's not a lot bound to it. It's really more, okay, they say that I should do this, and therefore I should do it. And it's, it's not based on necessarily on principle or reason or logic and all of these right. other kinds of things, well, you know, why we ought to find arguments compelling. Yeah. Let's take another call. Hello, John. Hello, Father Mitch. How are you? What, what can we do for you today? Pray for me, I'm 64 today. <laughs> Happy birthday. You're still a youngster. <laughs> Just a baby chick, thank you. Just a kid. For our guest and you, Father Mitch, I wanted you to elaborate and our guest explain about St. Louis de Montfort consecration and mm -hmm. the option through Mary and mm -hmm. what, what people can do to get closer to Mary and get this world more sane. Thank you. Sure. No, it's uh, a great question. The, the Marian consecration is something... Um, that I will say uh, right off the bat, I've never heard anyone say I regret my Marian consecration. I mean, it's something <laughs> that people just say, I wish I would have done this sooner. Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I know about this? Why didn't I do it earlier? Because you, you can kind of mark off a point in your life, like, okay, this is the point when I did the Marian consecration, and then all of a sudden my faith deepened, and, and there were so many amazing fruits that happened in my life. And mm -hmm. some of them come through very hard things, too. I mean, she's, Our Lady isn't superficial. She's always sort of rooting out things that need to be rooted out that are, are blocks to us um, loving her son. But the, the Marian consecration itself is, is really, St. Louis de Montfort says, you know, this is the shortest way to heaven, um, that she really helps us Bring, brings us to her son in a very new um, and, and dynamic way that we can't get without um, that deep relationship with her. Exactly. I have another call. Hello, Natalie? Oh, yes, hello. Hi, where are you calling from? I'm calling from St. Augustine, Florida. Oh, wonderful town. And your question? Yes, well, I've got to tell you, we do have devotion to Our Lady of uh, La Leche here, the nursing mother, but that's a, that's a old and a big deal here. But yes. uh, the, thing, the thing that is this, I've, I've just read about the Battle of Lepanto, uh, which was on, uh, in, in, 17, in 1571, and that was uh, Don Juan of Austria uh, won that battle, and, and it was a, a great win. Uh, it was supposedly the uh, battle was a key turning point in history. And uh, Pius V, uh, the uh, Pope at that time, had called a, for everybody in Europe to say the rosary. And so there was this powerful Mother of Mary, of Mother Mary, saying the rosary all over the place, and Don Juan of Austria was, was kind of the least one they'd expect to win this battle, but he did. And so um, I, the rosary was being said at the request of the Pope. So my question is this, would it be, and I know a lot of people are saying the rosary today, but uh, I wonder if the Pope, you know, would ever ask the people all over the world to say the work, to continue to say the rosary mm -hmm. for, for, uh, <laughs> for the rebirth of Western culture, if that's God's will, because it certainly is dying. So sure. that's, my, that's my question. Well, I think 
Pope Francis has actually been remarkably merry, and I've been really yes. surprised at how much he mentions Our Lady and recourse to exactly. her. Um, Especially the Our Lady Untire of, of knots. knots. Exactly. That's yeah. his favorite right. devotion to Our right. Lady, mm -hmm. based on an icon of Our Lady in Austria, I think. Is it Austria or Germany? Yeah, I'm not I think sure, it's but, Germany, it's, but it could be. Um, and I think it's an incredible devotion for our age because so many of us have knots within our families that aren't, it's not just one small problem, but it's layer upon layer upon layer of these different generations of brokenness. And so I think that, that um, novena is incredibly powerful and I think it's great that he promotes that. Um, but I haven't heard of him say, um, you know, encouraging uh, one particular day, maybe you know, of um, to promote the rosary. But I, again, he's constantly re referring us to her and suggesting that we, we have recourse to her. Yeah, and the, well, there's the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, which mm -hmm. is on the anniversary of the Battle Lepanto. of Lepanto. Mm -hmm. And also, St. John Paul II wrote his wonderful letter, mm -hmm. uh, Rosaria Maria, the, the, mm -hmm. the Rosary of Mary, uh, which introduced the five new uh, luminous right. mysteries, but also gave a very profound teaching on the rosary. We mm -hmm. went through that here uh, on my show, Threshold of mm -hmm. Hope, uh, when it came out. Some mm -hmm. oh, it's been <laughs> some years Twelve now. Twelve years yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. Longer. Fifteen. Maybe. Yeah, more mm -hmm. like fifteen years, mm -hmm. fourteen years, and you can look those up. Um, that's one of the things that we want to do. And there have been a number of organizations mm -hmm. that have also done international rosaries. Right. The Blue Army. Um, Blue Army does that. Fatima. And so. uh, a number of other groups where they have people around the world praying the rosary at the same time mm -hmm. on the internet. Mm -hmm. And a group in Africa leads, then a group in South America and Australia and so on. Mm -hmm. It's it's. The, she's right. We need to get international praying to the rosary. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, and Poland just gave us a great example. Yeah. Tell us about of, that. Um, they prayed at the rosary on the borders of the country. To they, they gathered. It was you know hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million people yeah, million, yeah. gathered on the borders of the, of the country to pray um, for peace for Europe and and um, for the survival of Europe. Really, it was really dramatic. Um, again, fighting or praying also about. Um, Islamic terrorism and all of those kinds of issues. That yeah, they were celebrating mass, I think in Chestakhova and some mm -hmm. other places. At the same time, people all around, surrounding the whole border of Poland praying the rosary, yeah. people in the plazas. These are the kinds of things we want to encourage. Yes, without a doubt. Yeah. I and think a lot Ireland of, uh, is also right. going to do this. The, the, mm -hmm. um, that's convenient. It's an island, yeah. so you can get the whole board of that. Oh, that you cover it all. It. Yeah. Well, and a lot of uh, dioceses are also consecrating themselves to Our Lady. Yes, I mean, they that's are. another thing I've been seeing a lot of. I think last year there were two, um, maybe Providence and one in South Carolina, and now more and more are doing it this that's year right. as well. So it's yeah. on the I know the Archbishop uh, of San Francisco and a number mm -hmm. of other Arch right. uh, number of other bishops mm -hmm. did the same. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good thing. And you know, this is one of the things that you're bringing up as this Marian option. When the, there are forces in the culture mm -hmm. trying to remove the option for God, keep mm -hmm. God out, yeah. out, out. Mm -hmm. That, you know, uh, th th that coach, I think, a foot, uh, football coach in Texas who was kneeling Mm -hmm. by himself and he got fired mm -hmm. but then well the the players joined him and then the players from the other team and then the crowd joined him and then they fired him they they can't <laughs> allow prayer yeah. and silence you know right. so it's um this is where this option mm -hmm. is very important i right. think right well, and I think you bring up the good point even about this idea of silence because this is one thing that's also problematic. I think some people struggle with the rosary because they find it very boring. And I, I address that in the book as far as what you happens do. when you're praying the rosary and how it's almost like a pilgrimage that, you know, the person that you were at the beginning of the rosary is not the person that you are when you finish the rosary. And, the, you know, these subtle transformations happen. But it's also, of course, prayer. And God is going to speak to us in very subtle ways um, during that rosary, that there's going to be fruit from it that we see when we persevere in our own lives and beyond. Yeah, and one of the things that 
I really loved that you uh, as you made as a point in the book is that the rosary is a development of the creed. We mm -hmm. say the Apostles' Creed mm -hmm. at the start of every rosary. Mm -hmm. And then going through the mysteries is unpacking, unfolding mm -hmm. the creed. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's a brilliant insight. Yeah, no, and, and that's, it's really all about the life of Christ and, and seeing how much, it's dramatic when you realize that Christ is at the center of all those, and then of course Our Lady is accompanies Him through them. Um, but it's it's just um, incredible to see the two of them together. And even um, Blessed Alan de la Roche made the comment at one point. Um, he was one of these people that had locutions of Jesus, and, and Jesus said to him, "If only people would pray my rosary." And so it was a, a clear indicator that he doesn't just see it. It's not just his mom's rosary, but in fact, it's his life, and we're experiencing exactly. his life in a very rich way when we're meditating on. Um, those mysteries of the rosary. When um, uh, the other things that I, I liked that you had, uh, just uh, I used it in a sermon <laughs> about uh, calling people to say the rosary at a church uh, just in, uh, a couple weeks ago in Montana. And one of the things I, I love is how you describe Our Lady. And uh, my dad was a vet of World War II, and mm -hmm. so we had the highest respect for General Eisenhower mm -hmm. and Patton and mm -hmm. uh, the other, Bra uh, Omer Bradley, all those generals. But we have in Our Lady, you call her a 12-star mm -hmm. general. <laughs> right. Yeah. Where did you get that idea from? Yeah, well, it came from a, from a priest, a um, very wise man. But, um, yeah, I think also just looking at her role geopolitically. I love one of my favorite apparitions. Um, and I only used apparitions that were approved by the Vatican in this book. I didn't want to have to go back and change things should things change. And I, mm -hmm. I knew also it would be way too long of a book if I covered, you know, the 2,500 reported apparitions of Our Lady. But... Um, that's you know the miracle hunter's job, but um, nevertheless, I um, the the apparition of Pont Man, um, where Our Lady appeared to a family, and the, only the children could see her. Um, this family knew that the Prussians were invading their town the next day, and she didn't say anything to this them. This is in the 1870s. Exactly, 1871, yeah. I think it was. Eight, yeah. Um, and she didn't say anything to them, but she held up a sign saying something to the effect of Jesus has heard your prayer, and she's called Our Lady of Hope. But in the official documents from the Prussian army, um, because the next day they were supposed to invade, they didn't invade. And the official documents actually say um, there was an invisible Madonna in the road and we could not advance. And that ended up you know, leading to the crumbling of their whole advance and the Prussians left France um, you know, indefinitely. But that was the end of that, that battle um, because of this invisible Madonna. Um, that was blocking their road. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, she's had very significant geopolitical influence. And we often think of her in very saccharine, ter saccharine terms as very s sweet and pious. But when you look at what she's done, I mean, she's, she's tough. Well, e even tough at a, another great battle, uh, when Vienna had been surrounded mm -hmm. by right. Turkish, uh, a large Turkish army of a couple mm -hmm. hundred thousand soldiers, yep. and King Jan Sobieski mm -hmm. came in. The Great Pole, yep. Yeah, he unfurled the banner of Our Lady, mm -hmm. and his cavalry just attacked the Turks, and mm -hmm. they just fled. Yeah. They just fled. Yeah, it was over before it began, really. And, and this is another case where you have the soldiers marching to Vienna, praying their rosaries as they're marching um, to the city. And so it's another one of those great rosary victories that we see protecting Europe. I think that even started, that, that gathered at Częstochowa. Mm -hmm, they did. Mm -hmm. And then they went yep. from Częstochowa, the shrine of Our Lady, yep. to save the people of Vienna from this Turkish invasion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been, you know, catastrophic for mm -hmm. you, the rest of Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, if Vienna fell, the rest of Europe would mm -hmm. fall. So this was uh, a, a tremendous battle right. uh, in which he, that, that banner of Our Lady mm -hmm. as our 12-star general, right. you know, and led them. the great spoils of that, I mean, the fact that they left so quickly, there were all kinds of things left by the Turks, including coffee and croissants. And so this is where coffee and croissants ended up being introduced so um, I like it better well, already. Well, yeah, it's a good battle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love coffee. Yeah. All right, we want you to take a look at the Marian Option, God's Solution for a Civilization in Crisis by uh, Dr. Kerry Gress, PhD. 
You can go to EWTNRC.com or call them 1-800-854-6316. Thank you very much for Thank being with us, for writing this book. And may the Lord bless all of you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, we can bring Dr. Gress to you and all of our other guests only because our Lord inspired Mother Angelica to have this network brought to you by you. Your gifts and donations are what keep us going. So keep us between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills. Thank you. <laughs>